It's not because you don't know how to pray. If there's a people that knows how to pray, it's the African church. We pray for all kinds of things. But the most common thing that we have come accustomed to praying for is warfare. While that is a good thing, my friends, it can become a distraction to your own spiritual growth. For when you spend your time rebuking the devil and you give that attention continually to him, when will you then give your attention back to God? There are angels that God created, that God built specifically for moments such as this. Where these angels come into gatherings, into houses, into secret rooms, and they begin to listen to the prayers of the people that are being prayed. These glorious beings are not permitted to touch the prayers that come from your mouth, lest they defile them. It says that the angels are given, they are awarded cisterns of gold, golden balls. And in those golden balls, they scoop your prayers. And when they take those prayers, they, they conceal it. And another angel comes and stands to defend your prayer. It says that that angel immediately shoots towards the heavens and rises to meet God. And God gives them preference and allows them to enter into his audience. And all the time. Why do we do that? I just wanted to know. Everywhere you go, people do that. But he is good. And he's good all the time. And all the time, he's faithful. Amen. This is a prayer and worship experience. And so this afternoon, we're going to be working very closely with the team. I'm just going to take you through some steps that hopefully will connect you back to a place of love. And that is connecting you back to the place mentioned in the book of Revelations, your first love, that's God. I'm going to share with you this afternoon, just for a short while, and then I want to pray. For the Bible says in the book of Matthew, that Jesus rebuked the people, and he rebuked the people for commercializing the gospel. He said that you have made my father's house into a house of commerce. Some versions will say trade. But he said, my father's house is to be a house of prayer. I like to spectate during the service, during worship and intercession. I like to stand at the back and watch people. The beauty about starting something new is nobody knows who I am. And so I have the opportunity to stand at the back and watch you. And then when I come to the front, I shock you because I call you out. But we won't do that this afternoon. To those that I knew, thank you for coming. Your presence is very much appreciated. Thank you for coming from wherever it is that you've come from, especially under these lockdown conditions. Your presence is appreciated. Amen. Especially you, sir. <laughs> Amen. We read from the book of Luke, chapter number 11, this afternoon. We read from the book of Luke, chapter number 11. Please stand for the reading of the word. Hopefully, if I manage to share this with you correctly, your seat will become foreign to you and you'll have the fervency to press towards God this afternoon. Amen. The book of Luke, chapter number 11. I read from the English Standard Version. It says in verse 1, Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins 
for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation and we would continue but deliver us from evil for thine is thy kingdom the power and thy glory forever and ever and clearly I'm the only one who knows that amen amen please take your seats amen 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 Allow me to extend a special thank you to Mr. Tonadzai and his team. Um, these are the guys who help with the setup. They're the ones who help to clean the auditorium after it's been used. They help with the logistics. They help as ushers. We are still growing. We haven't arrived. We're just starting. And so Mr. Tonadzai, Ano Tonde Ian, and everyone else that I may have forgotten, for your efforts, God bless you and increase you. This is good ground. Amen. This week I've chosen to change my approach with you because I've come to see that when I preach, people seem to be trying to decipher what it is that I'm saying. And so I took the advice of a good friend and I've decided to be a father this afternoon. And I mean that literally. I stand before you this afternoon, not just as a prophet, not just as a man of God, but really as a father. I'm in love with my wife. Let that be on record. I waited a long time for Sarai. This is my import. God brought this woman. Listen, she, you didn't let me finish, so now it, it's messed up. Sarai and I have been married for a couple of years now. Our marriage is still fresh. People will say that the reason we're in love is because of the fire of newness. It's not because of newness, it's because we believed for each other. There was trials, tribulations, it was a great journey. And now we are in the latter stages of that journey and going towards the destination of our calling. But the blessing that God has permitted us to experience in our marriage is not just each other. How many of us were in lockdown this past couple of months? Hey guys, you're lying, put your hands up. It was a national lockdown, national. Everyone here, including the child that's ignoring me, it's okay. We were all in lockdown. During the first lockdown, things happened. Things happened, people. And Sarai and I ended up conceiving because things happened for married people. Amen. Married people. I can talk confidently in front of my dad and say things happened for married people. My dad told me at my wedding to have 14 kids. I don't know about that one. Amen. And from that happening, there came a blessing. This is the second most beautiful woman that God has brought into my life. I've been surrounded by beautiful women my whole life. My mom is a beautiful woman. I have three beautiful sisters. But God allowed me to have a new beautiful woman put into my life. I say the second because the first is, of course, the first lady, Sarai. This one is called Sophia. That's the name of my daughter. I was gonna say the youngest, but she's my only right now. Sophia means wisdom. Those of you that follow me on Facebook would know that there was a season in my life, August, September, October, 2020, where I was just praying and asking God, God, give me wisdom, God, give me wisdom. I was praying and interceding for my daughter to come into this world. The name Sophia means wisdom. And God has given us more than we asked for. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter number three, or somewhere there, that wisdom stands at the street corner shouting, for how long will you continue to be a fool? And we'll get to that in just a moment. Since Sophie came into the house, 
It was tense at first. It was scary. I have a niece, my sister's child, her name is Brielle. Brielle, the female version of the name Gabriel, which means God is my strength. And for sure, she's a strong woman, that one. When Brielle came to visit the family for the first time, I had the opportunity to carry her. And I came to learn quickly that children, especially infants like yours, Chibo, are very fragile and frightening things to have. The reason why is because Brielle would fall asleep, but I wouldn't know if she was alive because she would stop breathing. Well, she wasn't not breathing. She just didn't make a sound. I learned the same thing with this one, Sophia. In the first couple months, weeks of Sophia being brought into the home, she would sleep like an angel. But the thing is, she would sleep a bit too much because we just wouldn't know if she was there or not. And so often in a panic, we'd have to go and check to see if Sophie was awake. For the first couple months, Sophie would do this one thing. It happens like clockwork. It happens without it missing its mark. Sophie would wake up. But the thing is, when she would wake up, we wouldn't know that she was awake. Deprived of sleep, Sarai would be snoring. I had to say that looking away from her. Because she works hard. And I would just be there, sleeping by her side, enjoying the melodies of heaven that came from her snores. Amen. But frequently what we'd have to do is we'd have to jump up to go and check if Sophia was okay in the morning. A lot of the times would be surprised that Sophia had been awake the whole time. We'd be welcomed by these big eyes that would be looking so curiously around the room, trying to investigate the place that she now lives in called Earth. If she didn't make a sound, we didn't know that Sophia was awake. But as time progressed, something changed. Sophie started getting hungry. And when Sophie would get hungry, what she would do is she would allow for her emotions to bubble up. And once they reach their climax, agitated, she would break into a cry. And when she would cry, you would know that Sophie is awake. If you would look at her, my child would turn red like the blood of Jesus because of how angry she was from not being fed. But lately, Sophie has been doing something very strange. I call it strange, just to add dramatic effect. It's not strange, it's normal. But what she would do every single morning at seven o'clock without missing a beat, Sophie starts to speak. The day that Sophie discovered that she had a voice, everything changed in the Moyo household. You'd be woken up not by Siri or the alarm clock. Some of you roosters, some of you the dog next door, some of you an ambuya, Some, you know what I mean? We'll be woken up by Sophia. She'll just go off by herself. But the thing is, she won't wake up to wake us up. She'll just wake up to have a conversation. And I, I'm a curious person. And I've often wondered, who is she conversing with? In my bedroom, I met three angels as a child. These angels are the angels that ministered to me up until today. But once upon a time, these angels just disappeared. Couldn't see them. And I thought I had done something wrong. But they would always stand at the same place, one by my bedside, one guarding the door, and one that would just tower over the whole house, watching the household. They just disappeared, and I didn't know where they went. I said, can I not see? Did I do something against God? Did I grieve the Holy Spirit? Fasted nothing. But now Sophie wakes up at 7 a.m., and you go and you look into her cot, and there in the cot... Sophie is speaking. Not only is she speaking, 
Her eyes are not blinking and she's looking at the exact same place that these angels minister to me every morning. I'm not saying it to get applause. I'm just saying it because I think that it's unfair. Why did God forget me? God. Everything changed the day that Sophie found out that she had a voice. What I'm trying to communicate to you this afternoon is perhaps this was the attitude that spoke or the conviction that ministered from John in the book of 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 14. He says that this is the confidence that we have that when we pray, God hears us. And because he hears us when we pray, we have the things that we ask for. And even if we don't have them, John says, it's not because God hasn't heard us, but it's because we prayed the wrong way. You see, John, by this time that he starts to pen the epistles, when he starts to write these letters, self-titled, one, two, and three, has now begun to mature. He's now begun to become an older man. He's no more the young, zealous John that boasted about being the one that had Jesus lay on his chest in the book of John. He's now more of a grounded, mature person. And in his maturity, he speaks about prayer, stating that I know how to pray. I know that when I pray, my God hears what it is that I need. And I know that when I speak to him, he listens. There's nothing that I lack because everything that I have needed, my God has awarded me. And the reason that John can afford to say this is because of an experience that he had in the scripture that we have just read out of the book of Luke, chapter number 11. One day the apostles are reclining on the mountain, listening to their Jesus talking to the congregations in the book of Matthew to tell you that this is the mount or the sermon on the mount. Jesus is speaking and there he is delivering the Beatitudes. He's addressing the people and he is telling them that blessed are you for this and blessed are you for that. And the people are receiving, but the apostles are reclining at the side of the mountain, possibly against a rock. And they are listening to Jesus communicating to the people. And they are mind blown by the menstruation of the Messiah. And once it's finished, once the people are dispersed, once they are released from the sermon, it says that Jesus withdraws. And this is how we come to the book of Luke chapter number 11, where it says that when Jesus had finished, they came to him hastily and they said to him, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us like John taught his disciples, an effective master, an effective leader is not one that demonstrates, but is one that instructs. An effective master is the one that is not afraid to empower people around him, recognizing that they would become his legacy. And so Jesus, without hesitation, introduces them to the template of prayer that is presented to us in our Bibles. When you pray, pray then like this. The reason that I thought to share this with you this afternoon is not because you don't know how to pray. If there's a people that knows how to pray, it's the African church. We pray for all kinds of things. But the most common thing that we have come accustomed to praying for is warfare. While that is a good thing, my friends, it can become a distraction to your own spiritual growth. For when you spend your time rebuking the devil and you give that attention continually to him, when will you then give your attention back to God? Amen. 
The church has not forgotten how to pray. We pray. But perhaps I am presenting to you this morning, as I stated in my opening remarks, that we have forgotten like the church in Ephesus being rebuked by Christ in the book of Revelations. Perhaps we have forgotten who our first love is. You see, when Sarai stood here, I was not embarrassed at all to say that that was my wife. It's not just about how she looks, even though she looks so honey. I say she looks Anyway, it's not just about the way that she loves me, but it's because on the 14th of December, here in Harare, Sarai and I stood at an altar and we made a covenant that we said we would not escape from. In that covenant, there was nobody else. We had people at our side and a bishop in front of us. But that covenant was to be determined not by them, but by me and Sarai solely. I'm not referencing Sarai, just to give her a shout out. But to say that my relationship with my wife, my marriage with my, my, with my wife, is a metaphor for the marriage that you are expected to honor with Christ. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that I am to love her the way that Christ loved his church. And that she's supposed to honor me the way that the church should honor Christ. We can't exercise covenant if we don't know who we are in covenant with. Many times I have seen men of God stand in front of congregations and say, let's pray. And people are challenged. It's powerful. But the problem that I have noticed is when we stand here and we call a people to pray, they don't know how to pray. And often it's not because they don't know what to say, but who their prayers are going towards. Jesus says in the book of John chapter number four, that we worship what we know, but you worship what you don't know. And the reason that Jesus says this is not because It's not because he is trying to attack their worship. But it's because a people cannot worship a God who they do not pray to. Up until this point, the arrival of Christ, people have been praying religiously. But it's only that, religious. Nobody up until this point was actually praying for the relationship and the development of it. And the reason why is because people forgot their covenants. They were in covenant with the temple, in covenant with the synagogue, but they weren't in covenant with God. This is why so many people were always in a place of sacrificing. The altar of the sanctuary, the altar of the temple, the place that Jesus stood to say is to be a house of prayer, was full of the blood of oxen and the blood of goats and the blood of sheep, turtle doves. It was full on the altars of old. And Jesus came to stand there to tell them, stop it. Your sacrifices don't move God anymore. But there's something that is able to draw the attention of God if you're willing to enter into covenant. It's called prayer. This afternoon, I don't just want to teach you prayer but I want you to practice praying with me prayer is not just about calling on God for your breakthrough it's not just about summoning God because you think that he is holy prayer isn't just about going to God to declare that the goodness and mercy of God shall follow you all the days of your life prayer is about inviting God to come into communion with you The importance of knowing how to pray, my friends, is that prayer is only something that can be done from this realm. Prayer is valued from this earth. 
there are people that have departed this realm, this dimension that don't have the opportunity to utter these glorious words to God anymore. But you being present in this place have the opportunity to, to engage the full attention of the God of heavens. It's a blessing that the church has greatly neglected. In fact, it says this in the book of Revelations, it says that when Jesus Christ has come, he comes as the mighty lion of the tribe of Judah in the appearance of a humble sheep. He's approaching the throne of God to surrender the sacrifices that he made on the cross. They are looking for somebody to open a scroll, but they can't find anyone to open the scroll. But here comes Jesus, having fulfilled his mandate. And once Christ has finished, it says that they look for someone to break the scrolls. And as Christ begins to break the scrolls, it says that the elders, 24 of them, these are beings that surround God. They are in the circle of God's counsel. They begin to take off their valuable crowns from their head and they begin to throw them at his feet. Your Bible says that. But it doesn't say that God was moved. Crowns were given as offerings and they began to sing, holy is God. But it doesn't say that God responded. He sat and said, you are doing only what you are supposed to do. But the same book of Revelation says that there are angels that God created, that God built specifically for moments such as this, where these angels come into gatherings, into houses, into secret rooms, and they begin to listen to the prayers of the people that are being prayed. These glorious beings are not permitted to touch the prayers that come from your mouth lest they defile them. It says that the angels are given, they are awarded cisterns of gold, golden balls. And in those golden balls, they scoop your prayers. And when they take those prayers, they, they conceal it. And another angel comes and stands to defend your prayer. It says that that angel immediately shoots towards the heavens and rises to meet God. And God gives them preference and allows them to enter into his audience. And those same angels begin to pour out the prayers from your mouth as incense unto God. And God inhales it and he is pleased. <laughs> Crowns made of substances that this earth does not have, failed to move God. Yet we are still trying to move God with the dirty dollar bills from our pockets. Your sacrifices are good. Your seed doesn't do anything for God. It helps me advance this vision. But your prayers are valuable before God. Last week, I spoke about the schemes of the devil, saying that the devil has been up to something. And the reason that the devil has been trying to get the people to be silent, the reason that he has been trying to get the people to stop praying is because the more the church stops praying, the more that God stops visiting this realm. But the Bible says in the book of Second Chronicles, that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from the highest of heavens and I will come and heal their land. What moves God to come to this earth? It's the way that you communicate with him. This afternoon, I would like to run you through the protocols of prayer to teach you how to enter into his presence that you might be able to understand and appreciate what worship is. Amen. Are we together? Are we together, church? Amen. Amen. When we pray, 
this is what we are going to do this afternoon. We are going to call God by his name. What is his name? His name that he has made available to us, correct young man, is Jesus Christ. When we call upon that name, the scriptures say to us that when we call upon the name, he is quick to come. But where two or three are gathered in that name, he is sure to manifest. I believe that every person that is gathered in this room has not come to behold the man in front of them, but to look towards the heavens and the God that is still concealed yet waiting to manifest before us. When we begin to summon his name, our flesh has the privilege of praying. Our flesh has the privilege of thanksgiving. You have things that you need to give thanks to, whether you know it or not. Thank God for your sufferings, for your sufferings have produced steadfastness. Thank God for his breakthroughs, for those breakthroughs have given you strength. Thank God for his, pers his presence, for his presence has shown that your persistent prayer reduces undeniable results. Once we begin to thank God, then God begins to respond to us. I will enter into his gates with praise and with thanksgiving. But you will notice that what the Bible doesn't say there is how to worship God. You see, praise can only be performed by the flesh. Thanksgiving can only be performed by the flesh. But worship is not permitted to be touched by the flesh. Worship is not something that your flesh can give God, but that God permits your spirit to receive that it might be given back to him. You can't worship what you don't know. And so when God permits you to worship him, he releases a revelation of who he is. Look through your scriptures this week. Go and investigate the times that men say that they fell down at the feet of God as though dead. They didn't fall down because of the countenance of the person alone, but because of the revelation that that person released of God. When Zechariah is standing in the holy place, it says that when he sees Gabriel, he doesn't know how to worship God. He asks, who sent you? Amen. People of God, let me stop there for this week. Let's pray. Why? Because we are still to grow. But I'm excited because we'll grow together. That's why we are here. Amen. Stand with me this afternoon. This will be when we pray part one. For part two, return tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Stretch out. I can see a lot of people are tired. It shows me what you were doing yesterday, what you weren't doing yesterday. Or maybe I'm just not for you. This afternoon, with the help of the team, thank you team, we're going to pray. This is what prayer looks like. His name is Jesus Christ, the reason that we have gathered in this venue. His name is King of Kings and what his Lord of Lords, the reason why we have assembled. I don't need to introduce you to him, but if I do, I'll be more than delighted to towards the end of this service. But if you know who Jesus is, you need that nobody teaches you how to worship him. As you stand on your feet this afternoon, begin to summon his name. Father, we bless you for you are good. Come, pray people. Father, we thank you for your love. Come, you have something to thank him for. Thank him for that child. Thank him for that breakthrough. Thank him for that marriage. Thank him for that graduation. Thank him for that promotion. Thank him for that deliverance. Thank him for letting you free. Thank him for vindication. Thank him for justice. Thank him for atonement. Thank him for his love. Thank the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Pray in a way that you know how to pray.